mentioned, and so now we also want to look at potentially um, looking at VOCs. So as an organization, we're trying to meet a need that necessarily has not been met by TCEQ. Um, it has been the history uh, in this area for most of the doc documentation and data to be provided by industry. So we're kind of reliant on them um, in that area. But one of the things that we've identified with some of the data that we've collected so far is that the trend that we're seeing is that majority of the time, we are within your national ambient air quality standards. But if you look at the data a little bit closer, you'll see that majority of the times, anywhere from 60 to 80% of the time, our levels are above eight. And there have been enough studies out there to say that vulnerable populations can actually have symptoms in that range. So, you know, so communities of color, you know, we live in a city that has never, that is in a non-attainment status. Um, and we're, what we're seeing though, is that people of color are still being exposed to high levels of uh, toxic uh, pollutants and they are demonstrating uh, health impacts because of that. So we know that the last administration had an opportunity to make some changes, look at the standards and modify the standards, they chose not to. So we hope that you will uh, and your staff will look at that again to see if there's that opportunity to lower the standards so that we can actually respond to those needs that are really out there in the public. You know, I will just comment on that last point. Um, I, I agree with you 100%. We've already uh, made the decision, along with the Science Advisory Committee and the National uh, the, the NES, that um, the previous administration made a mistake in not revisiting PM 2.5 max and the ozone max, and it's our intention. Whenever you look at pins on a map, but not just resources, yeah. but hills in our in the city of Houston, you'll find it in your black and brown communities. When it comes to resources, you don't see pins on your tool on any map, from vaccines to testing to what have you. Out here in Northeast Houston, we have six concrete batch plants. And some of those plants are trying to increase in size and get permitting for that. We're dealing with not only the railroads, we're dealing with vehicle emissions. A lot of our trucking industry is on this side of town. That makes millions upon millions of dollars. We have residents out in our black and brown communities that suffer from cancer and other illnesses as well. And this is something we live with on a daily basis. And this has gone on for decades. So I want to say thank you for being here in Houston. And we need out here, we need help. The people need help. It brought tears to my eyes to hear that story. To hear the stories of the people. People are hurting. Other people don't feel it because they don't live it. It hurts when we meet with Sandra and we meet with him Pat and we work with them and say, we are all neighbors from Cashmere to Fifth Ward to Trinity Garden to Verde Forest, what have you, Sunnyside, Pleasantville, we're working together because we all have things, more things in common when it comes to these environmental injustices than we have differently because of where we are on this side of town. Thank you. I, I had a, 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 a statement and a prompt. Um, Dr. Danae King, who works, well, I work with at Texas Southern University, and Reverend Conwell, um, we all know, um, work on 
issues around water quality and lead in the water. And I think the, the discovery uh, through uh, surveys and informal discussions that lead in drinking water in households in this very neighborhood where we are in Fifth Ward, um, there's a drinking water problem. Um, the billions of dollars that have been allocated in terms of infrastructure, uh, water, uh, water uh, systems and households where there's lead, uh, I think that's, that's a tailor-made um, funding for this community and other communities that have led in war. So we're talking infrastructure. So we need to know when the money comes down, when it comes to the state, especially when the money comes to the city and the county, we need to make sure, and you need to demand, that that money follows need. And I'm just saying that that's the kind of detail, follow the money, that our center at Texas Southern University will work with communities to, uh, to make sure that that money follows where it was water quality, or even infrastructure in terms of, of um, the streets, the sewer systems, drainage, flooding. These are all, it, it may not necessarily be within, e, within uh, EPA Administrator Regan's uh, purview, but he meets with that interagency, all those agencies that deal with uh, transportation and deal with other kinds of issues, uh, that when you make, there needs to be a clear understanding that, that these things are connected. Poor water conditions, poor air quality, um, contamination that's in the Superfund sites, the cancer clusters, all these things are related. related. So, um, I'm going to take a prerogative, if you haven't done I'm going to take a prerogative to say that we want to see when that money rolls out, whether it's EPA or DOT, Power Transportation, U.S., that it rolls out in a way that tackles uh, these converging threats. I just want, because if we just deal with the, the, with the water and, and not deal with the creosote and not deal with these other issues, we'll miss the boat. So let's think about how these things connect. And when you ask uh, for, for the administrator to respond, that you can ask beyond the, what goes to EPA, because he can take back when he meets with these other agencies. Could you deal with that, um, uh, Mr. Enrique? Yeah, I think that's, that's absolutely correct. Um, you know, with the bipartisan infrastructure deal, uh, EPA is slated to get over $50 billion to focus on water quality issues. Around $15 billion of that is solely dedicated to lead and drinking water. Over six to 10 million homes in this country are serviced by lead pipes. And we know that there is absolutely no acceptable level of lead exposure, especially to our children. In the Build Back Better uh, agenda that Congresswoman Lee fought so hard for that was passed last night, there are additional billions of dollars focused on lead as well. Uh, but as uh, Dr. Puller has mentioned, at EPA, we're putting metrics on how we push that money out. And it will be done through a lens of EJ and disparity. So the communities that need that money the most will be first in line. But going back to a statement that was made earlier uh, about the homes that have been abandoned that um, are fraught with lead paint. Uh, this is where Dr. Bull is making an excellent point when I go back to Washington, D.C. and I sit down with Secretary Marshall Fudge at HUD, uh, when we think about Houston, she and I would be thinking about lead in a more comprehensive way, lead in drinking water, lead in paint. But also, uh, 
EPA will get about five uh, billion dollars uh, in Superfund sites and brownfield sites and waste management. So when the waste management team thinks about uh, how do we dispose of lead and, and what landfill they go to, uh, Dr. Bullitt is painting an excellent picture that you can pull from all of these pots of money just to think about how to deal with lead. You do want to get it out of your drinking water. You do want it out of your homes, but you definitely don't want to store it incorrectly where it leaches back into the groundwater and you have it full cycle. So we're thinking about how we leverage all those resources across the board, but do it through a lens of, of environmental justice and, and inclusion. And I think at EPA, you know, what we're doing that's different is everything we do, all of our regulations, all of our policies, will be done through a lens of disproportionate impact and environmental justice. And so when we talk about PM 2.5, as we revisit the, t the PM 2.5 standard, we'll go beyond just looking at the national averages. We'll look at these hotspots. We'll look at these disparate impacts. We'll do the same thing for the ozone NAPs as well, because we have to take these things into consideration. We've already proposed standards to look at the NOx that's coming from these heavy duty trucks. We know that these trucks, whether it's an 18 wheeler or Amazon dropping off a package, we know that they spend more time in our communities, especially our urban communities. So when we think about that NOx exposure, we have to think about those scenarios. We're doing the same thing as we tighten car standards and light duty truck standards. And you know, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, when EPA proposed uh, the most stringent regulation this country has ever seen to regulate oil and gas, existing oil and gas, uh, the world was focused on the methane emissions. And I was too, and Dr. Bullock was too, but we also know the co-benefit are those VOCs, those volatile organic chemicals that are killing our communities because our communities are next door. So what we're trying to do is do a better job of looking at how we take into consideration these, these disparate impacts. And, and I would be remiss, as Dr. Bullitt has prompted me, and I'll take one more minute. You know, when, when Mayor Turner wrote me a letter and said, Union Pacific will not respond to the questions that I posed, and I'm having trouble getting TCEQ to help me get those answers, we responded very quickly and we pushed out a demand to Union Pacific Railroad to meet the mayor's information request. And I would say that they, they responded by providing uh, 219 files, over 62,000 pages uh, containing information that has never been shared before, that the city of Houston has been asking for for quite a bit of time. I share that because I think it's in it's important for me to say, I understand you all's mistrust of government. I understand you all's mistrust of uh, the state. And you probably don't have a lot of faith in the federal government either. Uh, but what, what um, Mayor Turner and I are attempting to do on that front is demonstrate that when federal and local governments work together, we can get the necessary information that we need that forces the state to act in a way that we all believe is acceptable. And if the state doesn't act, EPA can step in. We do have oversight over the state. So we've only been in office for eight or nine months, but I can assure you all that not only am I laser focused on this, but the President of the United States has said that environmental justice and racial equity are central to this administration. And that's not just the EPA, so it makes it very easy for me to reach out to Marsha Fudd and HUD, HUD and say, how are we gonna think about that? How are we gonna think about housing together? I can reach out to Secretary Buttigieg at DOT and say, what's your environmental justice strategy and does it match what we're trying to do at EPA? I can reach out to Marty Walsh and say, as we think about labor, and jobs, and economic development and fair practices, what's your EJ plan? All of our environmental justice and equity plans begin to match up. As Dr. Bullard is so rightfully pointed out, not only will the plans match up, but these historic dollars that we're starting to see, these billions of dollars, well, well they'll start to match up. 
And then, and then a governing principle is the president from jump, which a lot of people have put a lot of pressure on him about, but the, the overarching principle is he, he said at a minimum 40% of all of these federal dollars will go to communities that have been disproportionately impacted, not just for cleanup, but for education, economic development, and job growth as well. So there's a whole of government approach focused on these issues. Uh, we didn't get here overnight. It's gonna take some time to get out of it, but I can assure you that there are a number of us at the federal level that are really focused on this issue. Uh, Administrator Regan, I, I think both you and uh, Dr. Bullard somewhat stole my thunder. <laughs> because I, my ask was, how can communities, um, this community's Fifth Ward, Cashmere Gardens, have been working on this pre assault issue, as they've stated for a number of years, and it took a long time to develop from within these organizations the expertise they needed. And as, we, as soon as we thought we got to that level, we started finding out that people wanted a certain amount of additional expertise in, sci in the sciences and in the medical field that we didn't have. And because of TSU and COCO and these organizations, we were, we've been able to get some training here recently. But no, uh, uh, in, a, in addition to that, these community organizations that are addressing this we, we block walk in these communities. In addition to the training, uh, because every, you know, there are people that want to tell us that they support us and they've resourced us, but that's really by giving us experts. That's not by giving funding to these organizations so that they can get some things done. If that is, uh, if that is educating the community on what EJ means, because we work at a very, we're, we're, at, we're on the ground. We want to know, we need to help explain to our community what EJ is, because they don't know that our food insecurity is a result of environmental justice. That the fact that we have in, in Trinity Gardens and across Northeast Houston, several landfills that some of them, Dr. Bullock worked on having closed down 30 years ago. They reached capacity and nobody shut them down. The fact that we are dissected across this community by the railroad and no, not only they don't talk to the mayor, they're not good neighbors to us, and they have the resources pulled that they don't ever give us to do the things that communities should be able to do, to open the clinics and to give these resources to the community. So some of that press is gonna have to be on our neighbors that are not good neighbors. And so we asked this morning, what does that look like? Uh, and I know you've addressed it somewhat, but what does that really look like? Because we are the grassroots people and it falls on us to educate our people because they watch the news and call us for the explanation. That's right. No, I, I agree with that 100% and it goes back to the fact that there's a trust deficit with all of us and so if we are going to be successful, we have to arm you all with the resources so that when you do halfway believe what we say, you can share that with the community so that we can have some forward momentum. And I think that looks, uh, I think that can take a couple of forms. The first is, um, I have said over and over that I plan to use the full enforcement authority that the government gives me to hold the polluters accountable. So the first move is to be sure that they are held accountable and they come off the hill and not use taxpayer dollars to do what they're supposed to do. The second is, um, before we got into sort of the, the Build Back Better uh, resources, the president uh, lobbied Congress to increase EPA's budget by over 20%. And a good portion of that increase was focused on about 75 to 80% were passed through resources that we could give to communities, locally elected officials and the like, uh, to help with the resource gaps at the local level. Because we know if we're working in partnership, the local communities have to be well resourced. And then uh, yesterday, uh, the, Dr. Bullitt and I were talking along with the president of TSU about how we can partner together 
with HBCUs across the country and other advocates like Dr. Wright and um, you know others across the country to work with philanthropy and present a unified front on the types of resourcing community needs uh, have so that there's a flow of dollars that's separate from the government that gives you all a certain level of time uh, so that you can continue to push back. So the resource piece is key. I think it starts with us holding industry accountable. I think it starts with the EJ grants and the pass-through grants that we want to push through. Um, we don't want to force communities to partner with the typical partners of the past, which are the predominantly white institutions. Uh, we want our HBCU to be better partners to our communities. We talked about that. And then I think philanthropy um, is finally starting to step up and wanting to properly resource people locally on the ground. Yeah, hello, my name is Tracy Stevens. And I wanted to see what was your thought about emergency planning and community right to know that. Uh, I'm basically a researcher and I've been doing this for a number of years, whereas we try to get information from the state, from the city, from our local government, and we continue to run into these roadblocks where it may be sent to the attorney general where they rule and say, no, you can't have it, no, it's laws on the homeland security or we just not gonna give it to you because of some rule that they have or some law that they quote you and they even put dollars on it to where you can't afford to get the information. But what good is that to have that act if the communities can't get that information to then get the information out to the residents and that goes as far as for air quality, hazardous materials, whatever it may be we try to get this information. And a lot of it from some of these facilities, you know, is self-reporting. Some do, some don't. So we back again to the community's right to know, but we don't have a right to know because we are always roadblock. So if there's something that can be changed, something that can be looked at so that we don't continue to have these fights with TCEQ, Attorney General, the city, or whoever, and trying to access that information that's supposed to be public for the community, but it's not. Yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, I think transparency is, is key. I think that's what good government is. And I think that as you all seek information, to say, hey, we're under-resourced and we're dying by a thousand paper cuts. If you all could unite in your information request, I think that that would be uh, really strategic to do. Um, I also believe that it goes back to properly resourcing the communities. You all uh, should be equipped with your own air quality monitoring technology, water quality monitoring technology, and agencies like mine 